Test, test, test. There we go. We know how to do our job. That's right. Good morning, folks. Good morning. I think I'm on. I just I'm keep talking. Loud. Eventually, they will. I'm pretty loud anyway. Like, I you can shout at them. Microphone. There we go. There she is. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Anona. My name is Casey, and I'm so glad that you could be with us today. If you are new or visiting our church, we just want to say a special welcome to you. Make sure you feel comfortable, safe. Have, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to find somebody who looks like they know what they're doing. We have a small gift for you out in the lobby, so not Jeremy. We have a small gift for you out in the lobby, and if you're online, please feel free to just say hello in the chat. We'd love to say hi to you. And we do have a couple quick announcements. Okay. Number one, today is the last day for Mission Tree, so if you yes. took one of those ornaments, we need it back with the gift today. Yes. So this is 930 service. You still have time. If you're here and you forgot, run home after church, run right back with it. Seriously, folks, we do what that helps us get them to the families on time. Yes. And so we want to make sure they get these for the holidays. So if you did take an ornament, please, please make sure you get those back today uh, so we can turn those in. And thank you for your support as we help make a difference in our community with that. Absolutely. And believe it or not, Christmas is almost here. Yes. Holy moly. So we are so excited. We have some fun stuff going on to celebrate Christmas, one of which is happening the day before Christmas Eve, December 23rd at 6 o'clock. We are going to do a movie on the lawn night. Mm -hmm. So we invite you to gather your people, bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket, wear your favorite Christmas jammies if you want to. We're not going to make you. But, but ones that are appropriate to wear in public. Yes. All right. Just I know some of you, okay? So just... Make sure they're public friendly. And I don't want to police that yeah, because I'll feel will, uncomfortable. Want, so awkward. just make your judgment. So feel free to come, grab your launch or your blanket like we said. Uh, we are going to watch the Polar Express together and do hot chocolate and popcorn. And it's just going to be a really fun night to have some quiet community casual connection time uh, before Christmas Eve. And then the next day is when it gets all wild and crazy. We got three Christmas Eve services on the 24th, Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Six o'clock and eight o'clock are two traditional services up in our traditional sanctuary. Our contemporary Christmas Eve is at 7.30. Now we offset that to help with traffic flow because it's always a busy night. Lots of people coming. So 7.30, come early so you get your seat. And uh, also the next day, Christmas Day, we yes. will have one service at 10 a.m. in our traditional sanctuary. So if you want to come out Christmas Day as well, 10 a.m. over in traditional there, uh, Richard's preaching. We got Nate playing some awesome music, and it'll be a great service. That's right. And just a reminder that on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, there is no kids programming. Correct. So if you've got kids, bring grandkids, little ones that you take along with you, bring them with you into big church, and we'll all worship as a family. Yep. And with that, I think it's time to start worship. Let's do it.
Got to give us a minute. Got a fancy bass thing going on right now. <laughs> as we enter into our time of prayer, we want to remember the members of our church family who are sick or in the hospital and those who have lost loved ones this week. We want to remind you that there are prayer quilts out in the lobby where you can go tie a knot and say a prayer for the people who will be receiving those quilts. So they'll be wrapped up in our prayers, quite literally. And if you yourself need prayer, there is a Stephen minister available to you after the service. With all of that in mind, let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, we give thanks for the joy and the hope that this season can bring, much like the song we just sang here today. God, we thank you for community. We thank you for this morning. God, we thank you that we have the freedom and the safety today to come together and connect with others and with you and to worship freely. God, as we continue preparing our hearts for the birth of Christ this Advent, as we continue celebrating, we also recognize the challenge that this season brings for so many those of us who are grieving, struggling, or otherwise just not really feeling that joy this season. God, we thank you that you understand. We thank you that you know. We thank you that you do not ask us to put on a front or a facade and be um, celebratory if we don't feel it, but God, that on the other hand, you meet us right where we are. You enter into our hardships with us and our joys with us. And so, God, that is what we celebrate this Advent, is that we have a friend and a savior and a constant presence in you through the ups and through the downs. God, show us where you are in our lives. 
God, we not only pray for our own needs, but for the needs of those outside these walls. God, that you would show yourself to those who are in need and that you would help us to be the embodiment of Christ on earth as your church. That you would help us to care for those in need and to fulfill what you have asked us to do. God, we pray that you would bless our time together. And it is with all of this in mind that we now say the prayer that Jesus taught saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. time. And now it's time for our offertory moment. Now, all year long, when we talk about our offering moment, you hear about the life of this church, especially as we talk about mission and connecting with our community and the many ways we do it. This morning, we're going to talk about the day-to-day -day stuff. In addition to the, the ministries and to the missional arm of what we do, we have exciting things like electric bills and water bills and paying staff and, you know, getting the lawns uh, trimmed and, and things prepared for the season. So these are very important as well because, especially in December, 
uh, we rely on December heavily for us to actually get to make our budget. Summertime it drops because we have people kind of in and out with the summertime, and then usually it starts picking up in December. We rely on uh, an increase there from y'all to really help us cover our expenses each and every year. So we want to invite you this season to do something that, that's important to us as well, which is helping the church make a difference that we've done for past 150 years. So we invite you to uh, consider a gift to your church this season. If you'd like, you can call myself or Richard or Elisa if you want to talk more about it and how you can be a part, or even just uh, uh, whatever, whatever you can this time of the year it helps us all make a difference. So we're going to invite our ushers to come forward at this time. We're going to have a prayer as we continue on in our time of worship. So let's pray. God, this church has been here 150 years, and it has been pouring out in mission and ministry for you, whether it's connection to our schools, our community partners, or mission partners, or simply uh, people of all ages, from our youngest of members to our most senior. And Lord, we are thankful for the many ways that we are your hands and feet. Continue to bless us. May these gifts make a difference, Lord, for the next 150 years as we continue to be your hands and feet in the world. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy night, starry sky, we were dead until tonight. Christmas changes everything Long may the world inside us sin But he has come here to forgive Christmas changes everything
good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. We're waking up. I'm so proud of you. Okay, so I have said before that I'm at this phase of my life where I have no children, but a lot of my friends do have children, which is great for me because I love children and I also love sleep. So I get the absolute joy of borrowing all of my friends' babies, loving them, having the best time, getting all my baby toddler fixes, and then I give them right on back when I want to go to bed. It's perfect. Even last night I was at a wedding and somebody came up to me and was like, aren't you the one with the three kids? And I was like, no, no, I'm the one who loves the three kids and then goes to sleep at night. It's a wonderful life. Parents, I'm so sorry, but everybody needs a me in their life. I'll take your babies for a little bit, give you a break, give them right on back. So recently, probably about a year ago, actually, I was at one of these bonus children of mine. I was at her fourth birthday party. Baby girl just turned four. She wanted to do a pool party, or rather her parents wanted to do a pool party. That's probably what they wanted to do. So it's in the summertime, and it was great. Casual, grown-ups, kids, everybody's swimming, grilling, eating, all that kind of stuff. I'm in the pool with the birthday girl, having some quality bonus grown-up time, as I do. Just enjoying myself. And so you can imagine that I would be a little bit surprised that I wound up getting into a very deep theological discussion with said four-year-old while I am just in the pool trying to enjoy a nice summer day. Here's what happened. This is my life, you guys. Here's what happened. So apparently, birthday girl Mackenzie, she's four, like I said, she had just gotten done with vacation Bible school at one of the local churches in the area. So great. Love it for her. So she had all of this fresh knowledge that she wanted to share. She was so excited. She wanted to tell me all about the Bible stories that she learned and the characters that she heard about. And she kept wanting to tell me all about God and Jesus. God and Jesus. God and Jesus. God and Jesus. And now, Good, sound theology is super important to me, probably because when I was Kenzie's age, I got fed some not super great things about the Lord. And so I'm always trying to just like gently shepherd as we go. And like maybe let's just like course correct some things throughout your childhood formative years so that maybe you won't be super uh, traumatized when you grow up. So she keeps talking about God and Jesus, God and Jesus, God and Jesus. And I'm like, Kenz, that's so good. I'm so proud of you. Did they tell you about the Holy Spirit? There's a third person here. There's a, there's a third one. Did they tell you about that? And she's like, she thinks for a minute. She's, you know, four. She's pondering. She's like, well, maybe, but what is that? I'm like, who? Who is that? Uh, well, and then I realize, oh, dear, what have I done? <laughs> I am now about to try and explain the Holy Trinity to a four-year-old things that we can't even explain to each other, things that I went to seminary and took classes on, and I'm still like, "Mm?" (laughs) it just is. So I'm like, all right, all right, all right, what do I do, what do I do? So I'm like, well, God is God, and Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is also God, and they're the same. It's just one of them, but there's different. So there's three of them, but it's just one of them. So they're all God. (laughs) <laughs> was kind of my, that was my strategy there in the pool. And I just kind of waited. I'm like, huh? Is that, is that going to, is that going to float your boat? And this girl, she's so smart. She goes, you mean like a species? And I'm like, your parents, what are they? Baby Einstein and you, like, you are so smart. And in my head, again, I'm anxious and stressed now. So I'm like, well, no, not like a species. Like there's no metaphor that embodies the Trinity fully. So like, no, I don't want to say yes to that, but also you're four. So I'm like, yeah, that's good enough. So I'm like, yeah, kind of like a species, Ken. (laughs) Kind of like a species. She's like, okay, okay. And then she says, well, where are they? I said, what do you mean? Well, how do you find them? Like, what do you mean, Kenzie? How do you find him? She says, how do you see God if God's invisible? Where are all of them? They're invisible, aren't they? So how do you find them? And I just stopped. And I was like, how many times have I asked myself that same question? How many times have we asked ourselves that same question? How do you see God when God is invisible? Or better yet, where even is God? 
See, I don't know about you, but for me, the past couple years of my life have thrown me plenty of curveballs. And each one of them has challenged me and given me an opportunity to examine what I believe, why I believe it, and if it still holds up when life gets hard. Maybe you can relate. And it's because of those moments that cheap platitudes and rehearsed answers just don't really work well for me anymore. I can't just do the whole, oh, well, God is with you thing without digging into it a little bit deeper. I think I'm a lot more like Kenzie than I realize, and maybe you are too. Maybe you've asked yourself questions like, where is God when violence and hate seem to permeate our society? Where is God when try as we might, we just don't feel God the way that we used to? Where is God when God just seems so, as Kenzie put it, invisible? These questions make the name of Jesus that we are discussing this morning all the more interesting. We are journeying through different names of Christ this Advent season, and today we are finding our next one by jumping into Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. So this story goes that this guy named Joseph finds out that his wife-to-be Mary is pregnant, and all he knows is that that did not happen from him. And so he has made up his mind to end their betrothal quietly, because he's a good guy. He doesn't want to disgrace her. He doesn't want to shame her. He doesn't want to embarrass her for society. So he just decides, you know, I'm just going to end this quietly so that he can have his dignity. He can leave a relationship that seems to have been unfaithful, but Mary also has her dignity as well, which is where we pick up at verse 20 in Matthew's gospel, chapter one. It says this, as he, Joseph, was thinking about this, leaving Mary, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. It leads right into that answer that Kenzie was questioning back in the swimming pool. Where is God? Where is he? Emmanuel, God with us. According to this name, God is among us. God is next to us. God is beside us. God is with us. And this is not a new idea. Throughout the entire story of scripture, there is a common thread that shows that God has always desired to be with God's people. We see this in the very, very beginning of the whole book. In Genesis chapter one, we see God creating this world and we see God creating these archetypes of humanity and that in perfection, in harmony, before there is any evil, before there is any fallenness or brokenness, we see that part of that wholeness of humanity is an undisruptive relationship with God. It is living and walking and moving and breathing alongside our creator. We see that that was the intent, that was plan A was for God to exist undisturbed from God's people. Then later on in Israel's story in the Old Testament, we see that God chose to dwell in something called a tabernacle. It was a portable place of worship. It was a tent that Moses constructed so that the Israelites would have a place to offer sacrifices for sins and meet with God and have their times of worship. And this was used especially when the Hebrew tribes were wandering around before they made it to the promised land. So we see that when there is a wandering, moving people, we have a moving God. That for all of Israel's wandering, God refused to be distant. He refused to stay in a stationary structure when his people were on the move so that God could lead them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God refused to be distant. And then we get to Jesus. Our topic for today, Emmanuel. God in flesh, God incarnate, 
God who has come. And as John's gospel says, the word has made flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that phrase, made his dwelling, is often translated into something else, tabernacled. The word has made flesh and made his dwelling among us, has tabernacled among us. In Christ, God's desire to be among God's people continues to be seen. And then as we continue following the story of God and God's people, we get to the church, to me and to you. We're back in the book of Acts, but when Jesus was resurrected and before he ascended back into heaven, he meets with his disciples, he breathes on them, and he commands them to go and love others and make disciples and to be his hands and feet out into the world. The church is now the next extension of God, desiring to be among God's people, where now God no longer dwells in a tent or behind a veil in a temple, but right inside of us we see this common thread woven through the entire biblical narrative, this from start to finish, God's refusal to be separated from God's people. Emmanuel, God with us. And this is good and right and beautiful. And if I am honest, sometimes I still struggle with it because it is beautiful to read about. And this fuels our faith. And this gives us comfort and hope when times are dark. And yet, sometimes, even if we know all of these things, even if we have heard all of these things, I think we can all agree that there are times where we still say, where is God when God is invisible? We might know it in our heads, but feeling it in our hearts and experiencing it in our lives can be two different things. So even as we hear all of this and we're captivated by the beauty, we might still be asking ourselves, where? Where is God? A lot of you guys know this, but a couple months ago, I had to do something really terrible, very, very hard, I had to say goodbye to my furry companion, my best friend, Sailor. She was only five years old. She was my girl. She was my companion. And looking back, I can see that she was probably getting sick long before I realized that it was serious. Um, But once it got bad, it got bad pretty quick. It was about a month of us being in and out of the vet's office. There she is. So she was a lab hound mix. Her tongue was especially long that day because it was hot, and I am a crazy dog mom who got family photos taken with my dog. I don't regret it. That's sensible to me. Uh, What else would you expect me to do? She was a good girl. So it was about a month of us going in and out of the vet, uh, just honestly, almost every other day. Like, there was always something. Um, We did... I cannot tell you how many tests and runs of lab work and ultrasounds we did to try and figure out what was going on. Um, And there were days that I just didn't leave my house because I was so scared that something was going to happen to her while I was gone. Um, Everyone was amazing around here, and I was constantly in and out and working from home and doing this and doing that and rushing home to check on her and all kinds of stuff. And there were just those days where I just really couldn't get past it. I really was so scared that something was going to happen to her. But after a couple weeks, it really seemed like we had a shot. There were, she was on medicine, she was on special food, they had named it. They were like, it's inflammatory bowel disease, which is causing protein-losing enteropathy, and so this is happening, and this is happening, and this is happening. There are dogs that can survive with this. Like, she has a chance, we're going to treat it with steroids, we're going to have her on special food, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I was like, okay, maybe there's a shot. Like, Maybe we can beat this thing. And every day I would look at Sailor and, you know, I could, looking back again, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and I could see now that she was declining a lot more than I was letting myself realize because I just couldn't bear the thought of letting her go. So every day I would look at her, she would be laying on her bed, and I would, you know, get down on, in her face, and I would just say, you have to fight because I'm fighting and I need you to fight, and I can't lose you. See, some people 
think they're just dogs, but for me, they've always been more than that, and especially Sailor, because she was with me through everything the past five years. It was just me and her. It's always just been me and her. She was with me for my first time living in an apartment by myself without roommates. She was with me when my mom died. She was with me through all of seminary. She was with me through COVID. She was my running buddy, my snuggle buddy. I still can't sleep that well without her. <laughs> she took up like the whole other half of the bed. She was giant. <laughs> she was my companion. So I fought hard for her, and I did all the tests, and I did all the things, and I thought I could will it to get better. I thought if I just don't give up, she's going to get better. But there came a point where my dad and I were talking, and he, with his wisdom, you know, he'd, have, he'd had to make this decision many times with our family dogs growing up, and, you know, we had a hard conversation. He said, I think this is the hard part. And I said, I think you're right. And so took her to the vet one last time, took her to the park where we scattered my mom's ashes and let her have a one last moment um, outside just in a park and then went to the vet one last time. And the vet and I agreed that all the fighting that we had done just wasn't going to work. The medicine stopped working. She wasn't going to get better. And I couldn't do it to her anymore. You know, you love them enough to make that choice. Like, this is your final act of loving them, right? Like, you just can't, you can't do it to them anymore. And so we did what we had to do. So I laid on the floor, and I held her face against to mine, and I said, you don't have to fight anymore. I said, you can go get your grandma, and you can go home, and you're going to feel all better very soon. I was sharing this with someone after it happened, and after talking to me for a while and really just entering into that pain with me, um, I mentioned something about God being involved or whatever, and, you know, as we do. <laughs> and she said to me, well, is there anywhere that you did see God in all of this? In all of that, is there anywhere you did see God show up? And while at first my defense mechanism was to be sarcastic and snarky, I actually didn't go there because it was not hard. It was not hard for me to see where God had shown up for me in that experience. See, I realized that from start to finish, I was never, not for one moment, alone. There was not one time where I was by myself through that entire thing. On the day I had to let her go, I called my cousin, my person, my best friend, my sister, and we cried together on the phone, and I put her on speaker so she could say goodbye to Sailor, and I wasn't alone on the drive. When I got to the vet's office, I, you know, I do this weird thing where when people are like, can I help you? I'm like, no, I can do it by myself, and it's terrible, and I'm working on it. But when I got to the vet's office, I was alone, right? And I was back in the room with Sailor, and the receptionist knocks on the door and says, hey, I just want you to know Ashley's outside in the waiting room, and she says she doesn't have to come in, but she's just going to be right outside. Which, of course, like, leave it to my people to literally bang down doors of public, <laughs> public enterprises just to, like, be there. And I was like, no, I want her in. I want her in. Of course I do. One of my best friends in the whole world. So Ashley comes in, and I said... We, I call her sis. I said, sis, do you, are, do you for sure think I'm doing the right thing here? And she said, yes, I do. And I wasn't alone. While Sailor went to sleep, I was not alone. When I got home, another friend of mine asked what I needed, and par for the course, I said, nothing, nothing, I'm fine. She comes over anyways. I pick good people. She comes over anyways, and she makes tea, and she laid in bed with me while I cried in my house that was entirely too empty. The next morning, my dad brought me pancakes. That afternoon, a friend called and said her husband was making me dinner and it'd be on my doorstep. See, if you don't have a husband, you just borrow your friends. <laughs> <laughs> that night, another friend came over and sat in my living room and said, you will not sleep here in this empty house again, and I'm not leaving until you come with me. So many of you sent cards or texts or acts of love. And even just this morning, I kid you not, unplanned, 
I'm wandering around church, and one of our people, Bruce Anderson, who Bruce and I have a really funny relationship because we're always just like cutting up at each other. Like he's always in traditional distracting me when I'm preaching, and I've actually had to stop my sermons before to be like, Bruce, stop. Like I can do, I can deal with a lot. I did youth ministry for many years, but I can't deal with you laughing at me in the corner. So Bruce comes up to me and he says, hey, I have a present for you. I have a gift for you. There was a fundraiser over the weekend. I got you something, so don't let me forget to give it to you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is it? Like, I'm just ready. I'm ready for some joke. I'm ready for something. And he comes into my office, and he hands me this little stuffed puppy that kind of looks exactly like Sailor. And he said, you can put it in the microwave, and then it'll smell like lavender, and it'll make you cozy. (laughs) I'm like, I don't know if I want to put this puppy in a microwave, but okay. I mean, I'll do it because you gave it to me. (sighs) From start to finish in all my pain, I was never alone. I've never been alone. And on the days where it is so hard to see God, and I wish that I had an angel come into my bedroom like Joseph did and just tell me right where God is. And I wish that I had a voice from the sky and I wish that I had bigger faith than I do some days. And I wish that it was easier and the world was less messed up. And I wish there wasn't so much violence and pain. And I wish it was easier to see the good. Even then I look around and I see God through my people. Back in the swimming pool when Kenzie asked me, how do you see God if God is invisible? I stopped for a second and I said, well, Kenz, God is love. So anytime you see love, you see God. Anytime you see love, that's where God is. There are words that I borrowed from the Apostle John who said, Dear friends, let's love each other because love is from God and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God remains in us and his love is made perfect in us. Perhaps our love for each other is just one of Emmanuel's ways of still being Emmanuel. Perhaps all those times that Paul or Jesus or authors in the New Testament or words from God through prophets came and told us to take care of each other, to love each other, to care for those who don't have what we have, to seek justice. Perhaps all of those commands were so that God's spirit of Emmanuel could continue living through each of us, all around us, among us and through us, so that when God seems invisible, we can look around and say, there is love and there is God. So maybe this Christmas, instead of waiting for an angel to show up in our bedroom, instead of waiting for a voice from the sky, perhaps we could take a look around at the people who have shown us that we are not alone. Perhaps we could take a look around and recognize the times, even if just for a brief moment, where love wrapped love's arms around us. And perhaps we could seek to be that love for others. And rather than waiting for Emmanuel to show up out of the sky, we could pick up the call to embody the spirit of Emmanuel to those around us. Let's pray. God, it is hard to see you sometimes. There are days where our faith feels small and the world feels dark, even at Christmas. 
God, we give you so much thanks for the people in our lives that remind us that we are not alone those who have taken up that call to love us and care for us and give us that warmth and comfort that we know stems from you. God, help us to see where you have loved us throughout this year, even in the hard times. And God, help us to be love for others. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. embodied love for someone else. Let's recognize on our search for Emmanuel and our preparation of our hearts for Christ's coming this Christmas, let us recognize the places that God, that Emmanuel, is all around us through the love that we share. And where there is darkness, and where there is despair, and where there is pain, let us bring that spirit of Emmanuel there. That is our call as the church. God bless you and go in peace.